we, we cooking? We're cooking. All right, so I'm going to actually pause our current project here. Um, remember last time we were talking about uh, trees that are out of balance, and we wrote a little algorithm for is out of balance and things like that. So the next big topic we need to talk about that will probably be a, a two-day topic or so is uh, is ABL trees. It's not going to be a real fun topic, um, um, but we really need to talk about it. Maybe we'll do it Tuesday and Thursday next week so it's all within one week and just move on with life. It's an important topic, uh, but it's it's kind of a rough. It's not it's not very fun. All right, so I'm gonna pause this one, and we're gonna actually start a new Android project. All right, so now we're gonna have to come up with a, a name for this one as a, as a group because this is um, gonna be something that we're gonna end up building kind of by the end of the semester using data structures that we've had um, uh, throughout the semester. So now we're kind of seeing these things in, in practice. Now, if you are in um, some of my other classes, one of my other classes, uh, I think we discussed this in 450, um, this thing called a multi-user dungeon. So uh, a kind of a cave crawler type uh, uh, type thing. So think of it like a video game, but where you know you're in a room and there's exits to either you know the north, south, east, west, something like that. Uh, so these exits are are available. And then you take an exit, it takes you to another room, um, and you might have monsters you can fight in there and and, and that kind of stuff. So we're going to kind of create one of these uh, things, but we're going to create it for Android, where you're um, if you've ever seen the movie. Uh, how many of you have ever seen the movie The Cube? It's on Netflix. It's actually a, a there's a second one too, Cube Two, but the, the first one is is really really good. Um, the idea is that you uh, these these folks they just wake up and they're in the middle of this cube, like in this, they're just in this room with like lights around it and stuff like that. They don't know each other. They don't know how they got there. They're just there, and um, the uh, so you're in like basically a giant Rubik's cube, and you're just one of the little squares, and they're in there, and they're having to travel from room to room to room trying to get out. There's you know they presume there's an exit somewhere, um, so almost like a maze, but the, the rooms are moving and stuff like that. Then there's there's each room have traps and things like that. It's you know, but it becomes interesting. But the kind of the premise as it relates to this is um, you know because we're only seeing one screen at a time in Android. We are somewhere in the dungeon, and when we make a move and go somewhere, we're you know that's we're, we're crawling through the dungeon. So we're going to try to capture this idea of um, you know having a dungeon with ten or twelve rooms in it or something like that uh, that we can kind of walk through, and we're going to have to come up with ways to represent our dungeon and and uh, things like that. But we're going to start off with um, kind of a, a simple organization for this. So before we can have people moving around in the rooms of our dungeon and monsters to fight in there and all this other stuff, we need to have rooms that are linked together and us being able to move between those rooms. That's kind of a thing, right? Um, so we're going to have the idea of a room object. All right, so a room object is going to have several things in it. We're going to have a collection of players. Okay, so now early on, we're going to have, you know, maybe just us. But depending on how we are for time near the end, see, I'm about to sneeze. Well, it might not happen this exact second, but soon. Uh, well, it's a preemptive. What if I happen to sneeze like three or four times? Now I'm going to just not do it. Yeah. Oh, that's it's like a, it gets it to go away. This is like the, the third grade teachers when they tell you, you, see, you say that you, uh, uh, you have the hiccups and you want to go get a drink and then they say, okay, hiccup for me. And then you can't hiccup. Ever heard a teacher do that? You never heard that before? You know how they say you can like scare the scare hiccups out of somebody? I think my third grade teacher did that. It might have been in second grade or something where, you know, first of all, you probably had kids wanting to just go get a drink and that's how they cheated their way out of the room. They said they had the hiccups. But uh, she would say, oh, okay, hiccup for me. And no, they could never do it. They were scared to hiccup or intimidated or whatever see real real cure for it all right but you know if we have time towards the end we'll add some networking stuff in here too so we can have multiple players in the same game sharing the same map but in different rooms or something like that so kind of bringing together a lot of the skills 
that we've learned in here and putting them into a kind of a practical use. Make some sense? Okay. So in a room, we're going to have a collection of players. These are going to be human-controlled people. Each of them on, on their own Android device, let's say. Um, we're going to have a collection of monsters. We're going to have a description. So kind of what's what's in the room or something like that. You know, when you bring it into Android as opposed to, I mean, I, have I shown in here before or shown in one of your other classes this idea of... Um, Mud game. I guess I should only expect so much if you just randomly search for mud on Google. <laughs> Am I going to be able to get a big version of this picture? All right, well, you can kind of get an idea here, but this is actually a pretty advanced mud. This is using a mud client that shows you the map and, and things like that. So maybe that's actually a, a bad example for what I want to show here. The one I used to play was one called FIDAR. I hear this is a good example of a mod. All right, so, you know, here's kind of a mod. The whole game is text-based. Uh, they're telling you about the game up here. Then you're into a room. They show you the obvious exits to the north, entering the newbie academy of Lot J. Um, you know, you have this room description. You would also see who else is here once you're into an actual room, but it's all text-based. You know, when we get to uh, something like Android, we can maybe replace the description of a room with a, uh, an image or something like that. But for us, we'll keep it simple with just a description. So a room's going to have a description. A room is also probably going to have a name, kind of a, a title. You know, they mention here in this picture that uh, the room to the north is the newbie, the, the entering the newbie academy of Lot J. So that'll maybe be the lobby of that or something like that. So a room might have a name. For our testing, we'll probably just have like room one, room two, room three, that kind of stuff. All right, so let's kind of uh, leave it uh, like this for our rooms for right now. Um, now, when we talk about a collection of something. What are our options when we're dealing with a collection of objects? Well, we could put them in arrays, right? We could put it in a linked list. We could put it in a stack. We could put it in a queue. Um, which is, if we're going to have some players that are in a room, and these players are sometimes coming into the room, sometimes leaving the room, what's the right kind of tool to use for a collection in this case? A queue? Okay. Um, now, doesn't a queue imply an order? Like, you know, when we think about a queue, you think about like a line at McDonald's. Right. So whoever's, whoever's the first person to get in the queue is the first person who gets served by the register, right? The, the person taking your food order. You know, that's not it. When we all come into this, uh, when we come into this room, we become a collection of players in this room, right? Did it matter what order we came in? You know, we're just kind of all in here, right? And when one of you leaves, the number of people in the room shrinks. When somebody shows up, the number of people grows. So first of all, we need to have a, uh, um, you know, the ability to, you know, add people or remove people at will. Now, what could we use an array for this? So we'd have to come up with some maximum capacity for a room, right? We can say, okay, well, we're allowed to have 50 people in a room, something like that. Now, technically, this room, we can kind of say this room does have a maximum capacity based on chairs, we can decide. So maybe for this room, we have, you know, uh, an array of this, however many chairs are in here. And if somebody tries to enter the room, there's not an available chair, they get magically kicked back out into the hall, something like that. You know, but more realistically, we have flexible data structures that allow us to have an arbitrary size, uh, of, you know, an arbitrary amount of people. So we can, you know, grow or shrink as we need it, uh, needed to. So this guy's likely 
going to be a linked list. Right? Good. Uh, well, okay, so you're talking about array lists in Java. Array lists in Java are implemented in terms of, you know, actually, I think I've looked at this. I don't think they're implemented in terms of linked lists. You can think about the problem solving of an array list in Java the same as a linked list, but under the hood, an array list is actually implemented as a resizable array where I think they, you give it a maximum size and they grab that much memory at first, but then if you say you wanna add more people and you're out of room, it actually defines new memory, destroys the old one, copies it over. I'm pretty sure that's how it works under the hood. Otherwise they wouldn't call it an array list. They wouldn't use the word array. Um, so ultimately what we get down to here is this idea of uh, how it's implemented under the hood from a user perspective, you know, you add stuff to an array list, you remove, you remove stuff from an array list, you don't really care what's happening under the, under the hood, it just works. You know, who cares how memory inefficient it is. But an array list would be different than a linked list at the implementation level. But wouldn't make a difference unless you were doing a, wouldn't make a, a noticeable difference unless you were working with really large sets of data or something like that. Made my uh, John Daly a little strong today. I only used a half ounce of uh, tea for color this time. I've told you about the John Daly drink, right? Oh, that was, was another class. This is actually just iced tea, but uh, um, there's a professional golfer named John Daly who's kind of known to be basically just an alcoholic. <laughs> so the, 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 I decided that the um, because this bottle is a 48 ounce bottle. The, the, the traditional John Daly drink would be 47 ounces of vodka with one ounce of iced tea for color or something, something like that. So then you have the Arnold Palmer, right? That's half iced tea, half lemonade. It's a good drink. I like that one. Um, all right. So similarly to our collection of players, our collection of monsters, probably something similar. Link list. Description, this guy's just going to be a string. And name would just be a string. All right, so that's what a room is going to look like. Now, rooms need to lead to other rooms. So if we think of what we're in right now as a room, when we, let's, um, let's assume from my perspective, this is the door to the north, that's the door to the east, okay? to kind of keep things relatively simple. And in a lot of MUDs, you can have lots of exits in a room. You can have an exit up, you can have an exit down, you can, you know, because an exit is only given by its name. But for Android, maybe to keep it simple at first, we're just gonna kind of have an exit button, maybe four buttons, north, south, east, west, and buttons are either hidden or not hidden, depending on whether the room has that exit or not. Um, I guess we could also do northeast, um, northwest, so on and so forth, if we want to add some extra extra buttons. But, you know, in any case, when I take the door to the north here, I end up in a new room. Maybe we call this the CS hallway, right? That's the CS hallway room. So from within this room, if I'm looking around, I'm going to say, okay, well, like, what's the name of this room? This is the S120 classroom. And there's a description of this room, blah, 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 whatever it is. Um, then I'm going to see the list of people that are in this room. So there's going to be currently five people, including myself, in this room. Okay. Um, we I see no monsters at this point. Okay. But we reserved the right to introduce monsters into the room. All right. So, Charlie, you're the tank. You know what you know what tanking means in games. You're the guy. You're the you're the warrior. You're the one who's going to take the brunt of the damage while the rest of us sit back and cast the spells or hide behind this desk. All right. It's just, a, it's a thing. You were volunteered. It's a thing. All right. So, um, but then we're going to have a list of exits. Okay. And we got to think about what an exit's going to be. So we're going to have a collection of exits. Probably also a linked list. Now, we can maybe make an argument that your collection of exits could actually be an array if we're going to have a fixed number of possible exits, you know, maybe we say you're, you're going to have a maximum of eight possible exits or something like that. Um, but we can just make it a linked list. It's not going to hurt anything, right? Um, since we technically could have one exit, 
you hope you're not in a room with zero exits, but um, you hope you have at least one exit and you know up to eight or more if you're in a more complex world or something like that. All right, so we'll have a uh, collection of exits, which will also be a linked list. Well, now we want to think about the nature of an exit. All right, so an exit object. So we think about the exit as kind of being this door, right? So this door is, is, is our exit. The door links two rooms, right? So now we can look at this a couple different ways. We can have this door exist one time in our world. And depending on which side of the door we're in, we go to the other room that the door leads to. Make sense? So we can have a single door and that single door holds two rooms, points to two different rooms. Does that make sense? So this door points to that room, CS hallway, and that door points to this room, S120. And if I'm in S120 and I try to use the door, okay, so you know, I, I decide you know, the door is this magical portal that removes me from the room I'm currently in and puts me into the other room associated with that door. Okay. If I do that, then I can uh, say I want to use the door to the north. It will figure out that I'm currently in S120 and it will put me in the opposite room of that exit, of that door into the hallway. So that's one way we can think of our exits, is holding two rooms, right? Another way we can think of an exit is we kind of have an, an inside part of this door and an outside part of this door. So the door actually exists twice. From my perspective in here, this door leads to a destination, all right? And that destination is the CS hallway. So in that particular case, the door would only control one room. It leads to a single place and we happen to put that door that is a magical portal to a single place into this room. It's in the collection of exits in this room. Does that make sense? So when I walk through that door, when I use that door, it removes me from this room and puts me into that room, the destination of it. Does that make some sense? Okay. Um, now, so now from a... a, a designer perspective, we have to decide which of those two implementations makes the set makes sense. And let's draw a little picture here so we can consider this. So we're going to create S120 right here. And we'll call this CS Hall. All right, so I can either have What would a doorway be? Ah, we'll just keep using squares. We'll just make it a different color. Okay, so I can have an exit here. And we can have one exit like this. Or we can have two exits. where this exit over here knows about his destination, which goes to CS Hall. This exit over here knows about his destination, which goes to S120. And this exit is visible from CS Hall. This other exit is visible from S120. So this is kind of, from our perspective, the inside part of this door, and from our perspective, the outside part of that door. So we actually have two physical exit objects, one that leads to S120, one that leads, uh, that's from CS Hall, because we would put this inside of, that would be in the collection of exits of CS Hall. And this one would be from within inside of S120, because it would be in the collection of exits from S120 leading to CS Hall. So this is one solution we can have. Another thing we can have is we can have this exit 
this one object existing in the list of exits, the link list of exits in both of these rooms. So CS Hall and S120 both have a pointer to this single object. And this single object controls a list, controls both of these destinations. So it has the two rooms that it links between. Instead of leading down to a specific destination, it says, here are the two rooms I'm holding on to. When somebody tries to use me, if I'm the exit, somebody tries to use me, I ask where they're coming from. If they're coming from this room, I put them into this room. If they're coming from this room, I put them into this room. Make sense? So both of these are viable solutions. So now from a programmer's perspective, when we're trying to make the decision, when we're architecting our solution, we have to choose between these two. Which do we like and why? I'll start off by saying it's a valid argument to choose either of these. Either of these is a reasonable way of going about it. So now we just need to think about um, the ramifications of choosing one versus another. Well, would one be like using Yeah, I don't think so because we would probably implement the you know the two rooms here as just an array of rooms. You'd be a two bucket array, you know. We'd ask the question, the guy who's trying to use the uh, use the exit. We'd say, which of my two buckets are you currently in? Can, you know, player, give me your current room. If his current room is this guy, we would then throw him into this room. If his current room was this guy, we throw him into this room. Yeah, so I don't think it. I don't think it makes the um, uh, the underlying data structure any more any more difficult. Go ahead. I'm thinking that um, the single exit is probably a bit um, less cluttered, so I do want to deal with that one. Okay, tell me about less cluttered. Well, at the very least, when we're uh, building out our dungeon uh, in main or wherever we're trying to build it. I like where you're going with this, by the um, way. There are fewer lines that we have to write of, all right, this door connects to this place, this door connects to this place. Yeah. We can just say, here's a door, here's the two rooms. Here's the two rooms it links. Yep. So while this is perfectly viable, and actually this is kind of the cooler looking picture, so that's really one thing that I might kind of like, I like drawing, and this one's, this is this one better looking? It looks cooler, and plus I think I might have gotten these angles, like, oh, uh, they're, they're right, they're perfect. They might not be perfect, but they're perfect. Um, so, this maybe looks a little bit better when we draw it, but as he's pointing out, when I'm in main, or however I'm designing my dungeon, I mean, because we'll probably start off by doing it programmatically like that, we'll say, you know, here's my four rooms, we have you know, we have S120, we have CS Hall, we have S118, you know, whatever it is. And then we have exits that link all these things. But down the road, we might want to be able to design maps and have our program process that map and build out the rooms automatically, right? Maybe we represent our dungeons as like a JSON file or an XML file. So historically, we've talked about JSON or XML. It's just these data representation languages, right? Well, now we would have an application of that type of thing. You know, we want to design the computer science uh, department. So what we're going to do is we're going to write this thing into a JSON file that lists all the rooms and the exits between those rooms. And ultimately, we would process that file and build out the room and exit dungeon, you know, for the computer science department. That means that later on, if I want to make a, let's say we add an addition, let's say we get back the room from art or something like that that's over here, you know, now all of a sudden we can bring that room back into our dungeon and now we just make one little change in the JSON file, relaunch our program and boom, we now have that extra room. As opposed to if we have a very big dungeon, I know computer science isn't that large, but if we had a very big dungeon with hundreds of rooms and you got this really intimidating looking main that's just creating, you know, you know, 500 rooms and 290 exits. Uh, and these guys are all kind of interlinked some way, but, you know, just some guy and, you know, stayed up all night one day drawing lines and things like that to create it. And now that documentation has been lost. And now you're trying to figure out how do I hook these things back up? 
how do I add this one more room and what are all the little connections might be more difficult to manage. All right. So his argument is that it might be cleaner or easier to manage if I have a list of exits that link multiple rooms as opposed to have one exit that goes to this room and another exit that goes to this room. That might make sense. Right? Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean this guy's not viable, but it might mean that this guy uh, has some advantages when we think about where we might go in the future or we build our map, that kind of thing. Okay. So we're going to go with this one. Now, one's not better or worse than the other one at the end of the day. You can choose either of these, and we might even stumble upon something that this might have been a better solution for. But let's just go ahead, and we're going to say that an exit is a collection of two rooms. All right? It's, just a, it's a data structure that gives us a little magical portal between two rooms. Okay, so that's the information. So we're right now we're just listing the fields that exist inside of our uh, uh, our objects. We'll probably end up having some functions, right? So a couple times I've referenced, you know, when we take an exit. If I'm in this room and I take that exit, you know, I'm falling through the exit from this room into that room. So the exit, the the, the take exit function of the exit object is uh, going to have to ask the player that's trying to use the exit, what room are you currently in? And it would notice that I'm in S120, so it would say, okay, I'll put you in the other room then. Otherwise, it would be like one of those funny movies, right, when somebody runs through a door and they end up right back into the same room. In fact, that would actually be a fun thing to do with the mud, is have like a, like there's a small percent chance of time, uh, you know, like maybe a 5% chance that that happens. Because that would actually really throw a curveball for uh, for diehard mud players from uh, from a long time ago. Where, because like if there was a certain destination you were going to go to, you would end up memorizing the path. So you would end up typing in, you know, like, you know, in one line you would say like N S W W W N N N W, and that would take you to your final destination, taking all the turns and stuff, right? So you would just type that in real quick and press enter. Well, if there was a 5% chance of time that one of the times you looped in the same room, then all of a sudden that would be funny. Um, when I was in uh, junior high, I wrote a, um, a MUD. Uh, well, like a small MUD, not like a full whatever. Um, but I uh, wrote my, I don't know, messed up junior high mind, I guess. Decided it would be fun to have this like roaming wood chipper. So... You had this like entity that would go through the mud and it would replace a room with a wood chipper and it would take on all the entities of the room. And while you're in this the wood chipper room, you're taking damage, right? You're like being attacked. But so as you're going along, you might go north and north is usually the entrance to the forest, except now you're in the wood chipper and the, and the wood chipper and every every second the wood chipper moves to a different room. Okay, so the exits are constantly changing. So you're like, you're like flipping out, like, oh, I wanted to go north. Now there's no more north. And you can't escape the room. It's... Now you know what's wrong with me. It's a, it's a thing. All right, so maybe if there's time, we'll put a wood chipper in our... <laughs> the bigger question is, why did it have to be a wood chipper? Like, why was it fun to think about just putting a person into a wood chipper room? Gonna be on Dr. Phil at some point. The Wumpus? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. So, um, exit object. Each exit will exist once. So, in our little, in our real world example here, this door is a single object, and we have access to that single object door from this room. We also have access to it from that room. So we have two different rooms that point to the same single object. Make sense? All right. So what I'm really trying to explore here with us, because this is a simple enough problem for us to be able to conceptualize it, right? We're not creating this like really weird solution to some physics problem or something like that. We've all walked through the department. We know how these rooms are kind of linked together. 
but we're thinking about what if we have to implement this as a piece of software? Because at the end of the at the end of the day, we can learn about linked lists and stacks and queues and all this other crap. But if we can't put them together into a working solution, it doesn't matter. So now we're trying to look at a practical use of all these things that's also sort of kind of fun, right? All right, so we've decided that this exit exists once and there will be two separate pointers to the guy, one from S120 and one from CS Hall. Fair enough. All right, so those are our, that's how our exit will work at the field level. All right, so in order to build out my dungeon, do I need anything else? Or build out the, you know, we keep calling the CS department a dungeon, which, eh, if it was in the basement, maybe. All right, do I need anything else to give myself my basic prototype for, uh, um, for, for this thing? Or does that kind of do it? So let's go in. Now, we have to have a name for our game. Got to be catchy. Doctor's Dungeon? It's not, I guess that's not as horrible as I thought it was going to be, the way, the way you said it. What's this? Dragons and data structures. Yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> but do we start with dragons or we do data structures and dragons? Like Dungeons and Dragons, data structures and dragons? The dragons and data structures actually kind of has a ring to it, even though it's backwards. What do we think? Huh? This is a, a team vote. We're, we're going to be writing this. You're going to have impossible homework assignments over Easter on this topic if we don't come up with a good name as a group. CS Dungeon. Charlie, you just lost hit points. <laughs> <laughs> It's just, Charlie, go to the wood chipper room. <laughs> All right, so let's go. Dun uh, what did we say? Uh, uh, dragons and data structures. Mm -hmm. Do we like that better than uh, dungeons and data structures? You like data structures and dungeons, so. Well, no, no, that, that doesn't work, does it? So you like saying data structures first and dungeons second. This is kind of a, this is a spinoff of Dungeons and Dragons, right? It doesn't have to stick with those words, but if we're thinking Dungeons and Dragons, that's like the, the yeah, famous... Which one? Dungeons and data structures instead of Dungeons and Dragons. Then dun you can just shorten it to the first one. Oh, well, no, then it could be D&D. &D. Yeah. That's like the shorthand for Dungeons and Dragons. We're playing D&D. So dungeons and data structures. Okay, is that it? Yep. Very good. Okay. Dungeons and data structures. I like that. Okay, so we'll hit next. Oh, I did up. So this is the thing your dad doesn't like. The new. The new clock? Something like that, yeah. No, see, I've, so far I've liked the new... If you have a Samsung phone, they finally released Oreo, Android 8. Yeah, you know, even though Oreo came out like six months ago, <laughs> it's, it's finally out for... Uh, I didn't like it because it's such a Oh, so like the little change. He didn't, didn't adapt to the change. I got it. All right, so we'll start off with an empty activity for our our um, our main main thing, um, and this is probably going to be our Dungeons and Dragons or our D and D logo, right? This would be great. We could steal a D and D logo now for our Dungeons and, and Data Structures. See, doesn't this seem like more fun than ABL trees? And this is like practical, right? Maybe we should just come up with a way to incorporate an ABL tree into this. Just keep rolling with this. <laughs> or just deal with ABL trees at the high level, not actually write them. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and let's write a couple of our objects then. So we'll right click. I'm going to create a new Java class. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to create. Let's create the, um, well, I guess it doesn't matter. So we're going to create a room. 
And then I'll also go ahead and create the object for exit. All right, so hopefully we're kind of seeing the process we just went through. We kind of planned out our first few objects first. Now we're gonna write them and kind of fill in the blanks, okay? So we decided that for an exit, we're gonna have two rooms in here. So I mentioned maybe we keep this as a two bucket array, something like that, the two rooms at links. I and mean, we can certainly have um, just two fields. We can say we're gonna have room one and room two as fields or we can have a two dimensional array or a two bucket array where bucket zero is one room and bucket one is another room. Maybe just have, since there's only two rooms, just have two fields. Okay. So we're going to say private room R1, private room R2. Then we'll have public exit. And this guy will take in the two rooms that this exit links together. Right? And we'll say this dot R1 is equal to R1, this dot R2 is equal to R2. And now we have those, uh, those two rooms. Okay? Um, now, an exit probably also has a name. We didn't really consider this. Let's go back here real quick. So this leads to two rooms, but what about the name of this exit? Yeah, so does the exit hold on to the name or does the room associate a name with an exit? Kind of see what I'm saying? Yeah, but if we just look at this linearly between these two rooms, if I'm in this room, we decide this exit exists once, correct? If I'm in this room, that exit leads to the north. But if I'm in that room, that exit leads to the south. So it has two different names, depending on which room I'm in, but it's only one exit by our current implementation. But now we sort of have a coupling problem though. Um, by the way, have you talked about coupling in software engineering now? Huh? Just talked about it, good. I've mentioned it in here before, right? So uh, uh, we might have a coupling problem now though because we're we, we've chosen to create this exit object to link these two rooms together because that was convenient. But now all of a sudden, because so then I could just throw an exit into a room and uh, um, that exit is a, um, uh, will take me between the two rooms that it links, depending on which room I'm currently in. But now we have the issue of, if I've built this room, and I've built that room, and then we build the exit that links the two, when I let this room know about that exit, or when I let this room know about that exit, I'm gonna have to link a name to it. So when I, when I add that exit to this room, I'm gonna add it with the associated exit name of North. When I add that exit to that room, I'm going to add it with the associated exit name of South. So two different names. So it's the room that keeps track of where that exit is on its walls, as opposed to the uh, exit itself having a name. Does that make sense? So we've now have this, we've coupled our exits and our rooms together. Now, is that okay? Can one of those exist without the other? Is it okay to have those two objects linked together in a kind of an important way? Yeah, they're, they're, these guys seem to exist. So, you know, the things you've been talking about is coupling. You should minimize coupling when possible, right? But sometimes it's unavoidable. But maybe we want to make sure that we can't have an exit on the north lead to an exit on the east. So we have a distinction between well, but I'm not sure that necessarily makes a difference in a computer gener you know, computer represented dungeon. I mean, right. nothing says that this uh, that that this exit that we've said goes to the north doesn't actually lead to a dungeon, a room that's on the east. Right. So I'm not sure that that breaks anything. 
other than just it's you know it's just going to be weird if you're trying to like visualize your map so yeah i i think what we do is we allow the rooms to keep track of the the listed direction of an exit and the uh, exits just be the two rooms right so then we need to go back to our rooms when we have a list of exits this guy is going to hold exit objects so now we're going to have to have a list of exit names right um, or perhaps what we have is a list of exit containers where an exit container let's add another object here has an exit and has a name so this room would have an exit container what would be in that exit container that one exit that only exists one time as well as north from the hallways perspective it would have an exit container having that a pointer to that identical exit but with an associated name of south make sense so our exit container kind of does that linking between you know yeah this is a pointer to some exit that other guys point to as well but this is what i call it from within this room so we kind of have two options for representing it we can either represent it something like this with this exit container or we can represent it using a um uh, i'm sorry using a two separate link lists or two separate arrays you know however we want to two separate collections that are implemented as parallel collections where bucket zero of this guy relates to bucket zero of this guy bucket one of this guy relates to bucket one of this guy so on and so forth does that make sense that would be a parallel arrays type of uh uh, implementation which is not really a object oriented thing now an alternative here is in newer versions of java we have something called a dictionary now how many of you have seen python before did you have Python? Did you have Python in your 200 class with me? Yeah. Okay, I didn't remember when we switched over to that. So remember in Python we have dictionaries. So aren't dictionaries kind of the perfect solution for this? You have name value pairs, right? Yeah, yeah. We called it done. We called it cave crawler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now we're making it a uh, more object oriented version and with uh, with graphics and uh, we're going to add some networking stuff and also the JSON piece. So. Kind of the same core components, but a bigger a bigger thing. Um, so this is something we could use. Uh, we can use the dictionary class here, or we could write our own dictionary. That'd be fun too. But you know, the dictionary class again. This uses what's what's this uh, syntax called when we have those angle brackets? Generics. So we can have a dictionary, and this guy takes in two parameters for your generics. This is what kind of value is your key which ours would be a string, right? An exit name. What kind of value is your value? For us, it would be an exit object. That makes sense? So this could be a key value pair dictionary uh, in Java. Now, something to keep track of though is dictionaries have not existed forever in Java. These are something that were introduced in either Java 7 or 8, something like that, um, uh, which is okay. You know, most modern versions of Java have dictionary in it, but we do want to be aware of that. And this guy lives in java.util, the same place as linked lists and stacks and all those other guys live. Okay, so we can certainly, if we didn't have a dictionary, we can certainly create our own kind of dictionary thing here, right? Exit container. That's name value pair. Okay, or we can just use a dictionary dictionary of name slash exits to associate those guys. 
All right, so let's go and implement our room now. So in room, we're going to need a private linked list, and this is going to be of something called a player. All right, we don't have player objects yet, so I'm going to give myself a player object here in a second. Let's call this guy players. Now I'm going to go ahead and go in here. We're going to create a Java class called player. I'll also create a Java class. We're going to call this guy NPC, non-player character, which kind of falls into the category of monsters. Okay. So then in room, and let's go ahead and modify our room here and call this guy NPC. So we have a linked list of players. We have a private linked list of NPC. Then we're going to have a dictionary of name exits. All right, so this guy is going to hold strings and exits. And we'll just call that guy exits. And then we're going to have a description and a name. All right, those seem to be our fields. So in our constructor, we'll go ahead and um, initialize those guys. So we'll have public room. Uh, we might decide to go ahead and for the constructor for room, take in its name and its description and then go ahead and initialize those other things because those other things, players will be added to the room, NPCs will be added to the room, exits will be added to the room, that type of thing. But maybe initially a room does have a name and a description. So this guy will take in a string name and it'll take in a string description. And we'll say this dot name is equal to name, this dot description, Description is equal description. And then we need to go ahead and initialize our uh, two linked lists in our dictionary. So we'll say this dot players is equal to a new linked list. And this guy will be a type player. This dot MPCs is equal to a new linked list. Who what? NPCs. Non-player characters. That's what we named uh, that object. We named our, what used to be monsters. We called it an NPC. Non-player characters. So computer guys instead of things that are being controlled by humans. All right, so that's going to be a linked list of our NPCs. And that's going to give us an opportunity to maybe do some, uh, we might decide to make NPC an abstract class. And maybe we have monsters and we have like, you know, shop owners or something like that, where monsters are attackable and shop owners are not. Something along those lines. If we want to practice with inheritance and having a core abstract class that we never make we never have a generic npc standing there we either have a you know a werewolf bad guy that you, he's going to attack you you're going to attack him or you have the, the shop owner who's selling potions or something like that that you know you're not supposed to walk in and, and kill him he's supposed to like give him coins and he gives you back stuff but for right now we won't cross the uh the abstract piece all right, so this.mpc is equal to new linked list. Now we need to create our dictionary. So this.exits is equal to a new dictionary. Now, that's actually very interesting, the dictionary constructor for this. So it wants me to have a default size. Oh, very interesting. 
All right, so remember I mentioned that dictionaries were added to the language more recently. So it's much less integrated into the language. So when I created this, uh, the constructor for it, it went ahead and it gave me a string, it gave me an exit, and then it went ahead and It wants me to implement these pieces. It's really I'm gonna check something here real quick. We go back into the documentation here. We have to be able to use our, I'm gonna back this off here. They have to have default versions of those so we don't have to write the pieces ourselves. New dictionary. Yeah, let's see what it's screaming about. It's abstract. We have to create instances of dictionary. Hmm. We have to we have to override that to have our own version of what a dictionary is. It's not a very friendly implementation of dictionaries, is it? Yeah. See, the whole thing is abstract. We'd have to write all of these. Returns the value. Returns the. Think. Let's see if we have things that inherit from dictionary down here at the bottom. We have map. Oh, this class is obsolete. New implementation should implement the map interface rather than extending this class. Okay, let's look at map. Map looks pretty similar. Key value. Oh, but map is an interface. We've talked about interfaces before, right? Yeah, so those are the guys that dictate the things you have to implement, but we don't actually have an implementation. So map is an interface and here are things that use those maps. So let's look at a hash map. Clear clone. You can ask if it contains a key, so we can ask if it has a certain exit in it. We can get something related to a key. Okay, let's use a hash map. So just quickly then, let me teach about hashes. Uh, actually, I think the book, doesn't the book have hash tables in it? Pretty sure. So this will be very compatible with that. I must sign in. Yeah, hash tables, good, perfect. In fact, given that, let me just make sure it'll be compatible. I'm gonna back here. I'm gonna click on their hash table. It's a dictionary, it's a hash table. Keys to values, blah, blah, blah. Perfect, let's just use hash table. Hash map, I, I'm, I think it works the same way under the hood, but doesn't have a, um, Looks like it has a different starting capacity. Oh, 
what it looks like up here. Hash map versus hash table. Well, roughly equivalent because it was non synchronized. Oh, that's actually good. So <laughs> this is uh, this is actually a 450 um, concept. So a hash map is roughly equivalent to a hash table, except it's something that's called non-synchronized. So let me talk about both of those concepts here. Of course it is. Well, I already updated that. All right, so let's talk what a hash is first. Anybody, if you've had the security class, you know what a hash is? Ever heard of that? Okay. So this guy is a one-way cipher, which is obviously self-explanatory. <laughs> okay, so um, one-way cipher indicates you have an arbitrary size input with a fixed size output. As an example, so um, a popular hash is something called MD5. You may have seen this if you go and download some giant file off the internet or something like that. It'll have below it, here's the MD5 hash for that file. That's message digest five is what MD5 stands for. And so the idea is, so MD5 is an example of a hash algorithm. So let's say you just downloaded a four gigabyte file. Well, that four gigabyte file would hash to, let's just, um, I'm trying to think what's MD5. I think it's 256, a 256 bit. So four gigabytes would turn into 256 bits. Just as one gigabyte would turn into 256 bits. Just as three bits would turn into 256 bits. So you could have an arbitrary size input into a hash function and it would always spit out a fixed size output. Make sense, the general premise of it? All right, so with that in mind, what is the weakness of a hash? How many unique 256-bit uh, values are there? How many unique 256-bit values are there? Are the, 16. This is only 16. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll start us off. The first 256 bit value is 256 zeros. Zero, 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 zero. The second one is zero, 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 one. Third one is zero, 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 one, zero. Fourth one is zero, 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 one, one. A lot. Perfect answer. You have the mathematical exact answer? Two to the 256 power. Because we have two different bits, right? Zero or one. So each bit of it is either a zero or a one. And we have 256 of those. Okay. So two to the 256. Big number. A lot. All right. So shift that decimal point. What is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So 60, 68 more zeros. <laughs> After that, big number, a lot. All right. But it's not infinite. How many different files could we feed a hash function? Yeah. You could have, you know, an infinite number of Word documents, an infinite number of four gigabyte files, whatever it is. So we have an arbitrary size, you know, collection of in potential inputs, yet those are all going to map to a fixed size output, 256 bits. Now, the chances of you having two different inputs that both map to the same output are pretty small, right? Because two to the 256 is a lot, okay? but it's still possible. But that's okay, because the real use for MD5 it, uh, you know, for that guy, is you just downloaded this four gigabyte file, run your four gigabyte file through MD5 and see what your 256 bit answer is. Match it to this 256 bit. If it's the same, there's a really, really, really high likelihood that you didn't have any corruption during the download. Because even one bit off might produce a very different looking hash value. All right, 
So the only way for you to get a false positive there is if you if your download was corrupted in exactly the perfect way that it happened to also map to that same output. Make sense? Okay, so that's what a hash is. Hash is arbitrary size input, uh, fixed size output. Um, now, having said that, we have these things called collisions because we've already mentioned that there is a possibility of having more than one input producing the same output. MD5, like other hashing algorithms, try to be what's called collision resistant. So they have various internal uh, mechanisms to try to prevent the same data structure from having two things mapped to the same output. It's not impossible. I infinite, fixed. It's not going to be impossible. We will be able to find two things that map to the same thing. The defense is we try to make it so that it's extremely difficult to find two things that map in the same set. Make sense? All right. We don't really have to worry about that. That's more of a security topic you know, for how secure something is in terms of the number of maps. From our perspective, we know that we can throw something into this hash table and give it a key. So I can give it a key room one or east and give it a value that east should map to. And that's going to be the actual room object that that maps to. That makes sense? So this is our version of a dictionary from Python for all, all intents and purposes. Now, we saw two versions of this, two, so two different things that both uh, um, inherited from the abstract class dictionary. We had a hash map and we had a hash table. We're going to use hash table because that's a topic in the book and we'll be able to talk about those things together. Um, at the end of the day, they're very, very uh, similar. We saw from that search that the difference is something called synchronization. And this is actually a topic that we're in the middle of talking about in the 450 class right now with interprocess communication. So synchronization says, what if two different objects are trying to access the same hash map at the same time? And let's say they change it. Let's say this guy changes east to be this room. This guy changes east to be this other room. A hash map is not synchronized, which means there's potential that both of those guys are able to grab the same base hash map change it individually, and then whoever writes it back last would have the permanent change. A synchronized function, which, I mean, to make a synchronized function in Java, you literally just put the word synchronized in front of it, and it's automatically protected, okay? Which you're gonna wish that C had that, <laughs> but it doesn't. Um, but in any case, in a, a synchronized function says, we won't allow more than one object to grab this guy at the same time. So at the very least, whoever, whoever gets there first will get it, make their change, write it back, and then this guy will then be able to get it. So he'll at least have the benefit of having that change. Make sense? So again, from our perspective right now, this exact moment, not a big deal. But when we add the networking component to this, it might be a bigger deal because now we're going to have multiple users all doing this. For us, it probably won't make a difference, though, because we're going to actually be generating our our dungeon at the very beginning, there's only going to be one process doing that. But when you see that word synchronize, that's what it's talking about. All right, make some sense? All right, so we will pick up from here next time. I think what I might do is I might actually just keep trucking on this since it looks like it's going to give us lots of opportunities to look at some stuff um, related to the stuff we're supposed to still do in the book. And then I might try to come up with something that will allow me to incorporate an ABL tree into this. I don't know what that's going to look like, but that might be the hack. Make sense? All right, so should there be homework over? Read the, read the Easter story. That's a good one. All right, read the Easter story for your homework. All right. You don't have to write anything. Just read the Easter story. All right, if you're traveling, have a safe trip. I will see everybody on Tuesday. Remember, if you have class on Monday, it's canceled unless it's after 4 p.m. So classes that meet after 4 p.m. on Monday uh, uh, still meet. Classes after 4 p.m. today do not meet. Classes tomorrow do not meet. All right. See you next week.